Welcome to this class on refugee rights. What we're going to be looking at is where refugee rights come from, what the rights a refugee has, and also the status of refugees in Southeast Asia. Importantly, throughout history, there's always been refugees. People have always had to flee their country to safety in other countries because of persecution. People have found because of their religious belief or their political beliefs, or even because of their ethnicity, they may face threats to their life or discrimination and the need to find safety in other countries. Refugees have contributed to society as well. There have been many famous refugees like Albert Einstein and Karl Marx. Even more popular famous people like Freddie Mercury and MIA are refugees. So refugees have fled countries and found safety and contributed to society. There have been many laws about protection of refugees. So throughout history, refugees have got protection. And this is done through laws around sanctuary. So various religions have laws saying that they can give sanctuary to people. And also early laws of asylum as well, where countries recognised refugees fleeing from other countries. But the challenge has been that not all countries recognise refugees all the time. Countries can be selective about who they recognise as a refugee. Sometimes they can select some people and not others, or some years they decide to not have refugees. And this has been a challenge because it means that if you're a refugee, it can be arbitrary, it can be unsure if you're going to get that protection. There have been attempts to try and change this, to fix up this system. A more recent attempt to change this system was during the League of Nations, which is from about the 1910s through to the Second World War. And the League of Nations introduced this thing called the Nansing Passport. It was named after a famous Norwegian explorer, and this passport was given to people who were displaced from their country. And these were people who were displaced because of the um, Nazis in Germany, or the Spanish Civil War, or people fleeing the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. But with this passport, they could get sanctuary in some countries. But again, the problem was that not all countries recognised these refugees. Some countries would turn them back to their own country. So when it came to after World War II, when there was a massive number of refugees, it was recognised this problem needs to have some kind of international response. And that's where we get the Refugee Convention and also other UN bodies which manage refugees. The importance about the Refugee Convention is it does two things, two important things. Firstly, is it defines what a refugee is. And secondly, it details some rights of refugees. So first we now need to look at well, what is a refugee in law? How is it defined in the Refugee Convention? We will start by looking at the definition of a refugee from the 1951 Refugee Convention. The definition is found in Article 1 of the Convention, which shows that there are five main elements a person must meet to be considered a refugee. Let's look at these five elements. The first element is that a person must have a well-founded fear. This means that the person must have a fear of some kind of persecution. A person having that fear is not enough because that fear has to be real. So there are two components. A person must feel the fear, or what is called the subjective element, and that what they fear could happen, the persecution they face is real. The second element is the person has to face persecution. While there is no definition of persecution, it is generally taken to mean some form of human rights violation. Most refugees flee threats to their life or personal security, or they are threatened with jail. Persecution can be not being able to go to school, marry, or have a baby. For the third component, a refugee must be persecuted because they form a part of some kind of group. The convention gives five kinds of groups, or categories. They are race, religion, nationality, membership of a particular social group, or political opinion. Let's look at these categories. Firstly, we will look at race or nationality together, as they are overlapping categories. There is a tendency to now use the term ethnicity instead of race or nationality. There are many people in exile because of their ethnicity. These include Tamils from Sri Lanka, Nepalese from Bhutan, and the Uyghurs in China. Next is religion. People have been persecuted because of their religious belief. For example, Christians and Muslims have fled from persecution in countries like Pakistan, Iran, and China. Many refugees flee persecution because of their political beliefs. There are many political opponents, for example, of the government in China who now live in Europe or the United States. In Southeast Asia, 
Political opponents of the government of Myanmar, Cambodia, and Vietnam have refugee status. The last category is a member of a social group. A social group is any group which a person cannot leave. For example, family members of opposition politicians. A person cannot stop being a son or a sister of a politician. As another example, a person cannot change history and not be a child soldier or a former member of the police force. This category is commonly used for LGBTI, seeking safety from persecution because of their sexuality or gender identity. If they are persecuted because they are seen to be part of this group, then they are recognized as a refugee. Refugees must face persecution because they are part of a group, and this is called the nexus, meaning there is a connection between the persecution and them being in a group. If someone is persecuted for other reasons, say it is a random criminal act, then this is not grounds for claiming refugee status. A refugee can only claim refugee status in another country. They must cross a border or be in the other country to claim refugee status. A refugee is someone who seeks protection in another country, so logically they should get to this other country. This does not mean that people who seek refugee protection in an embassy in their own country are not considered refugees under the Refugee Convention. A refugee can only claim protection if their own country cannot or will not protect them from the persecution. Given that mostly people are seeking protection from their government's persecution, it is obvious that their government won't protect them. But there are cases when a woman is claiming status because she may face some gender-based violence, like domestic violence. In many countries, the police, courts, and welfare services can offer protection so she cannot claim refugee status. But if the police and governments do not help women escape from domestic violence, then she should be able to get refugee status. To be a refugee, the person must comply with all of these elements, not just most of them. If they fit the definition, then they are a refugee. Okay, so looking at the definition of a refugee in the convention, we see there are a number of elements there in order to be recognized as a refugee. However, just because you fit the definition doesn't necessarily mean you're a refugee. In order for a person to be recognized as a refugee, they need to be in, in a country which has ratified the convention, in a country which recognizes refugee rights. This means that in some countries which haven't ratified the convention, people can't be recognized by that country as a refugee. Now this process is called refugee status determination. And this is the process where a person in a country which has ratified the convention can be recognized as a refugee. But there are also other alternatives to that because we know that in some countries that don't, haven't ratified the convention, a person can be recognized as a refugee through the UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugee. Because if they fit the definition, then it does mean that they're a refugee. It just means that countries yet don't recognize them as a refugee. Now the difference between these two types of recognition is that one is a convention refugee means that a refugee is determined by the convention. And other ones are called mandate refugee, means that they're recognized by the mandate of the UNHCR. Now there are some other categories of refugees as well. We know that many refugees who are fleeing conflict or natural disaster, who have to live in camps, they may not fit the definition, but we still tend to call them refugees. We tend to call them humanitarian refugees. Now they have different rights, of course, to convention and mandate refugees. So what this shows, it's kind of important to see which countries have ratified the Refugee Convention and which of these countries can then recognize refugee rights. So let's now turn to a, an overview of Southeast Asian countries and see which have ratified the Refugee Convention and where refugees are in Southeast Asia. Let's look at how many Southeast Asia countries have agreed to the Refugee Convention. As we can see from the map, only three of the 11 Southeast Asia countries have agreed on the Refugee Convention. These are the Philippines in 1981, Cambodia in 1992, and East Timor in 2003. Around the world, about 145 of 193 countries have agreed to the convention, and not that many in Asia. In Southeast Asia, according to UNHCR, the country with the most refugees and asylum seekers is Malaysia with about 150,000, and next is Thailand with around 120,000. Apart from Indonesia, with around 12,000 refugees and asylum seekers, all other countries have less than 1,000. There are a significant number of internally displaced people in the region, with around half a million people internally displaced. Mostly, they are in Myanmar, but the Philippines and Indonesia also have internal displaced people. 
Over half of the refugees in Southeast Asia come from Myanmar. Other significant source countries are Sri Lanka and Pakistan. So, there are different kinds of refugees. Firstly, a convention refugee is someone who was a refugee in a state which had ratified the refugee convention. Only Philippines and Cambodia in Southeast Asia. A mandate refugee has been recognized by the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, or the UNHCR, as meeting the definition in the convention, and they are recognized as a refugee according to the UNHCR's mandate. So refugees in Thailand and Malaysia are mandate refugees, recognized by the UNHCR, but not by a country. Another important definition is asylum seeker. Most states around the world do not recognize refugees immediately, and instead they start a process to check if what the refugee says is true. During this process, the person is known as an asylum seeker, a person who seeks asylum to become a refugee. This term is not found in the refugee convention, but was made up afterwards. The process of being identified as a refugee is called refugee status determination. Refugee claims are also done by the UNHCR or a government body. While it should be a factual process, it is both complex and political. Countries can choose which refugees they recognized based on if they come from a country they are opposed to or friendly with. So let's look at the status of refugees in Southeast Asia and some of the major refugee movements. So since World War II, we've seen two significant movements of refugees. The first is during the, the Vietnam or American War in the 1970s, or going from the 1960s through the 1970s. We had somewhere between three and four million Vietnamese and Cambodians and, and people from Laos leaving that country. Some crossed overland into Thailand into refugee camps. Many got into boats and fled the area into the Philippines or even further away of Singapore, Indonesia and Hong Kong. Now, after that refugee flow, the next major refugee flow was out of Myanmar in the 1980s and 1990s. So because of conflict between the ethnic armed groups and the Burmese military, many people found themselves unable to stay safely in that area. So many fled into refugee camps in Thailand, but also Burmese refugees went into India, a small number to Bangladesh and Malaysia as well. So these are examples of refugee flows within the region. There are also refugees who come to Southeast Asia from other parts of the world. From South Asia, there are refugees from Sri Lanka and Pakistan and Afghanistan. From Africa, you have um, refugees from places like Somalia and Eritrea. And even from East Asia, you have refugees from China, say the Uyghurs, and refugees from North Korea. Now, all these groups often flee because they are persecuted because of their political belief, sometimes persecuted because they're a member of an ethnic group, and sometimes persecuted because of their religion. So all these refugees have come to Southeast Asia, sometimes to move to other countries and resettle, sometimes to find safety in Southeast Asia. So let's turn to look at, well, what right should a refugee get? And what are the major concerns of refugees in Southeast Asia? Let's look at the rights a refugee gets. There are a list of rights in the 1951 Refugee Convention. These include freedom of religion, right to access a court, right to elementary education, the right to earn a wage, the right to own property, access to housing, and the right to move freely within the country. Refugee rights in the Refugee Convention are mostly awarded in two ways. Firstly, some rights are given to an equal level with nationals of the country, meaning that refugees should be treated the same as citizens. This includes access to courts or access to elementary education. Other rights are given to the same level as other non-citizens. The convention mostly uses the term aliens for non-citizens. In these cases, the refugee will be treated the same as any other legal migrant in the country. For example, the right to work or go to high school. The Refugee Convention is over 60 years old, and it was introduced before any human rights treaties. Since then, human rights have developed significantly, to the extent that they are often stronger than the rights found in the 1951 Convention. As a result, nowadays a refugee's rights are simply their human rights. They should get any existing human rights in the country they are in. Human rights are much broader than the small list in the Refugee Convention and they also give a refugee greater protection. There are many human rights found in the Human Rights Conventions which are important to a refugee. Let's look at some. The right to basic health is important. 
a refugee mother and her young child should get access to reproductive health. The child should have its birth registered, and it should be vaccinated and get all other health services a newly born baby needs. The right to access justice is important for a refugee, as they can be vulnerable to abuse and may need protection of the law, or to be able to use the court system to stop their expulsion from a country. Food, water, and housing are also important rights, particularly for refugees who have fled a country and are living in a refugee camp. In this situation, many refugees may face severe conditions, and they should be provided with sufficient food and water and ensure they have somewhere safe to stay. A refugee child should get access to children's rights, or a disabled refugee access to disability rights. There are some rights in the convention which are specific to being a refugee. The main one is the right to non refoulement or the right not to be returned back to the country from which they are fleeing. non refoulement is a French word, meaning to push back or to force back. The principle of non refoulement is considered fundamental, so all states in the world have to comply with it. This right means that once a person has entered a country and declared themselves a refugee, a state can only send them back once it has determined they are not a refugee. Non refoulement does not stop a country sending a refugee onto a third country, only not returning that refugee back to the country they are fleeing from. So, we just had an overview of some of the refugee rights in the uh, Convention. Let's now look at what are the status of refugee rights in Southeast Asia and what a refugee needs. Now, an important first thing to consider is that in terms of refugees, we have two populations. One population is refugees who are in refugee camps. Now, in Southeast Asia, the major camps along the Thai-Burmese border. Okay, there are some camps in Indonesia, but generally they're the only camps. So the second group of refugees is urban refugees. And these are people who are living in urban centres such as Bangkok or Kuala Lumpur or Jakarta. And they've come to those cities to await their refugee recognition, to have their status determined. Now the challenge here is that they can be waiting for five to ten years before they're recognised as a refugee and resettled in another country. And during that time, there's obviously going to be some concerns about their vulnerability and security. So let's just look at some of these concerns that refugees face. The first one, importantly, is that all states must recognise what's called non refoulement non refoulement is considered customary law, which means that all states have to recognise it. And this is that states can't send a refugee back to the country where they may be persecuted. They may send them on to a third country, but they can't send them back. So non refoulement means you can't be refouled or sent back. So if a country like Thailand, which hasn't ratified the Refugee Convention, still has to recognise non refoulement The second important point is that when refugees are waiting for their status to be determined, they often have to look after themselves in terms of getting work, earning money, sending the kids to school, having health and education, having a place to live. And this is going to be difficult if they are kind of considered an illegal migrant by the state, if they don't have legal status in that country which means that many refugees have concerns about you know, food and housing and education and health and so on. And that's where a number of refugee organisations step in to help. A final concern is security, that these refugees are going to be concerned that because they're not legally in that country, what happens if they meet the police? What happens if, they be, if they're arrested? They can be put in immigration detention and they can be deported from the country. So another major concern of these refugees is, is their security. Let's finish up the class by looking at two contemporary refugee concerns, and ones which people are working on now because these are problems which need to be solved. The first one is the growing discrimination against refugees. In many countries we've seen an anti-refugee movement, or refugees being called terrorists, or refugees being trying to stop from entering the country. Now this is a worrying development because we know that throughout history, you know, most refugees enter into countries and adopt that country and grow up to contribute in that country. You know, refugees are not, are not a threat, but still there are these movements which are discriminatory and sometimes racist against refugees, which needs to be um, responded to. So a second concern is going to be climate change, because we know that in the near future there is going to be millions, if not tens of millions of people who are displaced because of climate change. This is going to hit Southeast Asia quite severely. We know that the current refugee infrastructure doesn't really protect or doesn't really fit these refugees. So people who are displaced by climate change really have no protection. And we know that with these massive movements of people, it is going to put significant stresses on society. So there needs to be a, a response to this. Now, there are some movements through United Nations and countries to respond to this. 
but as yet we haven't got a system which protects environmental refugees. So given these two final points, we'll, we'll finish the class on refugee rights.